Welcome to worship at Harvard Avenue Christian Church. It is a joy to be in this moment with you, both here in the sanctuary and for those of you who are joining us online. For those of you who are joining us virtually, we hope that you found your way to the links below this worship cast. You'll find there a connection card as well as our children's worship and wonder link and a link to our online giving. For those of you in this sanctuary space, we hope you found your way to one of our worship packets which contains a connection card. If you would please fill that out to note your attendance in any ways we can be in contact with you. It is good and well that we come each uh, Sunday to this time of reflection, to pray, to join our hearts and minds together. Let us prepare to worship God. As we come to a time of prayer this morning, I hope that you have made note of the names in our Sunday worship email, friends and family in our congregation that we invite your prayers for this week. We know that you bring many prayers with you as you come to worship today, so I hope that you have used the connection card either in your worship packet in the sanctuary or in the link below the video at home so that we can be in prayer with you and for you in the days and weeks ahead. We're so grateful to remain connected in these ways, even while many of us remain apart. As we come to prayer this week, and we consider our theme, Fasting from Bitterness, as part of our different kind of fast, I would invite us into a moment of silent prayer, and then I will pray for us together. Will you join me? God, we are here with you today, and you are here with us, and for that we give thanks and praise. Sometimes all we can say is that we made it here. Sometimes that is all the effort we can manage. And yet we know, we pray with confidence that you are a God who meets us wherever we are and however we got there. You are a God who loves us as we are. You draw us into relationship with you, especially through Jesus Christ, who taught us what it means to live as you would have us, to live into the calling of our name, to live into the wonder of our created nature, to live into the glory that you have in mind for the world. Jesus showed us these things, and sometimes we forget. And so we pray that in those moments, and there are far more of them than we would care to say, that in those moments you would forgive us for our shortfalls and that you would remind us that you remain present, always ready for us to return to you, to our direction, to our path, to our home. We are grateful for your Holy Spirit that moved over the waters in the beginning and created all that would be. And we pray that that spirit would move in us now and recreate again. That you would help us fast from bitterness. That you would help us remove that distraction from our lives. And that you would show us the goodness, mercy, compassion, justice, hope, light that can take its place. We pray for those who are hurting for those who are in need of healing and comfort, 
for those recovering from surgeries and those who are caring for them. We pray for so many grieving losses in this last year. Just this week, we marked more than 500,000 souls lost to COVID-19, let alone all that were lost to other causes. So much loss and grief in this last year. Bring your comfort, Lord, as only you can. Make us instruments of your peace, of your grace, of your mercy, so that we might do your work in the world to care for those in need. Remind us of the beauty of our created nature, the way you have shaped us, the way you form us still, and recreate in us each day new opportunity to be more and more who you have called us to be. We pray with humility, with gratitude, with confidence, with thanksgiving. We pray in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we're going to have two readings this morning, one from Hebrews chapter 12, and then one from Luke's gospel, chapter, uh, chapter 15. The first reading, chapter 12, verse 14 of Hebrews. Make every effort to live at peace with everyone 
and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now we're going to read the last part of a very familiar story to us. The story of the older brother and the story of the prodigal son. Verse 25, chapter 15. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. This is the reading of God's word and God's people did say. Well, we started uh, last week this sermon series a different kind of fast. And what we're talking about this whole Lenten series is giving up different things than we would normally give up during Lent. What we're giving up is we're going to focus on, we're focusing on giving up attitudes and habits and dispositions that stand between us being the people that God has called us to be and that God is creating us to be. You see, it's an opportunity. I don't think that Lent is necessarily a somber, sad season, but it's really an opportunity. And we should be glad because God gives us this season every year to do a deep dive into our hearts, into our lives, to really examine ourselves and to think about the things that we want to change and what we want to add to our lives so that we can live into being the best versions of ourselves that we can be. Allow me to remind you that God is deeply invested in you and in your life. God cares about you. God loves you. God is for you. And God doesn't want you to do this work on your own. God doesn't say, hey, go fix your life. Go get to this work. And when you get it all done, come back and give a report. No, God says, I'm patient with you and I'm with you. Invite me in and we'll do the work together. You know, you may be tired right now, but God never gets tired. You may feel like you don't have the power to make the change in your life that you want to make, but God does have the power. It's unlimited. And you, at this point in your life, as you face the things that need to be changed, you may be thinking, I give up. But God will never give up. And that's such good news. Because today, we're going to need some help. Because there is something in your life, in my life, that has a grip on every, every person in this room. It touches your life, and it touches my life. And it's one of the big things that provides a huge barrier between us and experiencing the fullness of life that God has for us. And it is bitterness. Bitterness. The grip of bitterness. I'm reminded of a story I heard from an old preacher some time ago. It was about a man who uh, went to the hospital because he wasn't feeling well. He had been bitten by a dog, and they discovered that the dog was rabbit, ra- had rabies. So he goes into the hospital, he checks in, 
And they do the test and they find out, indeed, this man does have rabies. And unfortunately, at the time, there was no medical procedure, no medical answer to the problem of rabies. And so the doctor who was treating him had the unfortunate task of informing him that there was no cure. So he looked at the man laying there in the bed who had been diagnosed and said, I'm sorry, sir, to tell you, there's nothing we can do for you. My advice for you is that you need to get your affairs in order. The doctor left the room, and when he returned, he found the man in there, and he had a pen and a paper, and he was writing vigorously on this paper. He was working so hard, and the doctor looked at him and said, I'm glad, sir, that you're taking this seriously. Are you making out your will? And the man looked at him and said, no, doc, not at all. I'm making a list of all the people I'm going to bite when you let me go. (laughs) Now, I, I will tell you, I almost didn't want to tell the joke because it's a bad, it's just a bad preacher joke. But I tell the joke because it's true that when we hold on to resentment, that anger and that resentment will fester into bitterness and it will make us angry, biting, bitter people. Bitterness is unforgiveness that is fermented. Bitterness is unresolved pain and anger and frustration. It's what grows inside of you, inside your inner being, when you don't treat it and you don't release it and you just nurse it and you hold on to it. Now that story we just read, so often we don't read the last part of the story because we focus all of our attention on the younger brother in the story. He's the one that gets all the views. Younger brother runs away from home. Younger brother squanders his father's inheritance. And what is the inner disposition of the younger brother when he returns home? He cowers back to his father, and he is carrying shame. Shame is that part of you and me that keeps us at distance from God that says, I'm not worthy of your love. Treat me like a slave. But when he goes home, because the father is loving and filled with grace, and even though his reputation has been sullied, he welcomes the man back and says, no need for shame. I love you. You see, that's who God is. God is a great God of grace and love. But the older brother wants nothing to do with it. The older brother has never left home. And from the moment his younger brother left, he's been carrying anger inside of himself. And now when his brother has returned and he hears the music, he he hears the party, all that anger and all that resentment just comes boiling over and spilling out of him. And listen to him. He doesn't refer to him as his brother. That son of yours. And why is he bitter? Dad, I've been working for you all these years. And you show love to him and no appreciation for me. And in the story, who is bitter? This older brother. And this is the story of two lost sons, but one son is found, and the story ends with the older brother bitter and separated from the love and the grace of God. You, you see, bitterness, bitterness not, doesn't want to just move into your heart. It wants to take over your heart. And when it metastasizes, it sours everything it touches. Bitterness will keep you trapped in the past. Bitterness will prolong your pain. Bitterness will skew your perceptions. Bitterness will blind you to all the good that's going on around you. Bitterness will erode your trust. And bitterness will ruin your relationships. The love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, Love does not have resentment. Love is kind and love does not resent others. But another translation of it says that love does not keep a record of wrongs. But what happens? This is we all do this. When we're hurt, what we do, it's like we got this big imaginary file cabinet in our life and we get hurt. Instead of releasing it, we file it away. We file it away. We file it away. And then before long, we got this whole huge filing cabinet, a record of wrongs 
that have spilled and spoiled and turned into a festering bed of resentments. And you want to know what I see in my counseling with couples who are going through marital trouble? That one of the biggest factors why their marriage does not survive or they're living in a miserable marriage for years, it's because of the bitterness and the resentment that they filed away and have not dealt with it. And it comes out like this. You always... You never, do you remember that time? They can't deal with what's going on in front of them because every time they encounter any kind of difficult moment in the relationship, they open up the file cap and they just start pulling all the stuff out instead of releasing it. Because invariably, friends, invariably, when we hold on to hurt and if we don't transform the hurt, we don't let go of the hurt, we will transfer the hurt to someone else. Hurt people hurt people. Because it's it's true. You you if you're a human being, you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna get wounded, you're gonna be misunderstood, you're gonna be insulted, uh, you're going to have things that happen that are not fair. And if you can't find a way to quickly release them, eventually it will spill out of your life and affect everybody around you including those who are often damaged the most by bitterness. And it is, it is our children and those we love the most. Personal story. Uh, Ministers are no different than anybody else. In fact, I would say that if you scratch the surface of most ministers, you'll find a lot of bitterness under there. Because ministers are servants at heart. Ministers have a tender heart usually, But often it's the most tender-hearted people who are often that become the most bitter because we're not allowed to be bitter. And so we just push it down, we push it down, we push it down until it spills out. I'm no different than anyone else. I like to think that I have a thick skin. I'm able to handle most things. But over the last few years, I've had a critic, a, a constant critic. Most everybody's encouraging, most everybody's loving, most everybody's kind. But you can't lead any organization or be a, a, a pastor without having a critic. I had a critic. Every few months, he would send me an email. Every few months, he would send me a letter. And oftentimes, in the criticism, it was well-founded and helpful. But it was the tone of the criticism that hurt. It was the lack of the criticism and the grace. And it was what, how he saw me and the way he treated me. And for a long time, I, I, just, I, just, I just tried to let it go. I had conversation with the individual. I sat down and talked with the person, but nothing ever changed. I never got a pat on the back. I never got anybody say, hey, we appreciate all the good things that you do. Just always, every time, full on negativity and criticism. It got to the point that whenever that person was in the room on a Sunday morning, we'd have 300 people in the room. This individual would be sitting at the back of the room with his arms like this, head down, disapproval. When I left, I said, thank you, and I said, goodbye. And then last week, David Emery, your preacher, stood up here and said, be quiet, and it was a mistake. Because when I got quiet last week and sat down, I realized that he moved here with me. I was still carrying it. You can move 652 miles, but until you release the bitterness, it travels wherever you go. And some of you, you know you're carrying bitterness for someone who's long since dead. You know, dead people are hard to please. (laughs) I got that from Kevin. (laughs) Here's what I've learned. I've learned this. If you're holding on to bitterness, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or a broken person. It just means you're a human person. We get hurt. And the last thing I want to do in preaching a sermon on bitterness is to not only uh, identify something that's painful to you, but to put shame on you. There's no shame here. Just understanding. Because everyone carries it. The other thing I'd say to you is there's a big lie that we've heard over and over again, and it's not true. We hear this lie that time heals all wounds. It does not. 
Time just allows the wounds to grow more deeply. That's why he says in Hebrews, he says, make every, great, every effort to live at peace with people. That's why he says don't allow the roots to grow deep because if you don't make a decision early on to release it, the longer you hold on to it, the deeper the roots will go. So it's not time that heals all wounds. It's what you do with the time that you have. And ultimately the antidote for, for bitterness is always the same. Forgive and release. Forgive and release. And forgiveness, it's a decision that you make. And it is a process that goes on. And I will tell you this, that forgiveness, this is what we're talking about here, is that, it, that this takes real courage, friends, to be honest about something that's going on inside of us because nobody wants to acknowledge our bitterness. Nobody wants to show the ugly part that's inside that's grown, that's festered. But the reality is that you can't heal what you're not willing to face. And you can't heal what you're not willing to acknowledge the damage it's done to your life and to the people around you. Healing begins when we ask God and say, God, show me, like it says in Psalm 139, show me and search me what's inside of me that I may be able to bring it to you so that you can heal it and release me from it. Now, the reason we don't forgive people is because we think it hurts them. But not forgiving someone or holding on to a grudge is like drinking poison and thinking it's going to kill the other person. It only kills you because it's toxic. The other reason we don't forgive, we don't forgive because we think it means that what they did didn't matter. That's not what it means. If you've been hurt, it does matter. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that what they did to you didn't matter. It did matter. But you see, God wants you to forgive because God loves you. It's not, it's not just that God wants you to release the person that's hurt you. It's that God knows that you need to release the person because it helps you. And the reality is that you've got people in your life, I've got people in my life that will never want, they don't even know they did anything wrong to you, they don't care that they did it, and they don't want forgiveness, they don't care, they don't care about you. You're not forgiving for their benefit, you're forgiving for your benefit because you need to be released from it. You need to be set free from it. Because you've been hurt once, why continue to be hurt again and again and be trapped in the pain and hurt the people around you and let that pain be collateral damage? You want to know what's easy to do? It's easy to hold on to hate. It's easy to hold on to hurt. It's easy to become bitter. You know what's hard to do? It's hard to forgive. And that takes faith and it takes courage. But here's why we can do it. Because we have a good God. We have a loving God. We have a God full of grace who welcomes home the brother who squandered everything. We have a God who will welcome home the embittered too. And you can open up your heart and life to God because God loves you. And there's nothing in your life that God that doesn't know about that God will not heal. The same way that Jesus Christ took all the wounds of the world and all the sin of the world upon himself to forgive and transform. When you open your heart, this is the gospel. I'm getting excited. Can you tell? This is the gospel. Come on now, help me. <laughs> that when you bring it, when you bring it, when you bring it to the cross, God takes it and transforms it and gives us resurrection. And so, and so, friends, this is something you can't do on your own. This is the place of greatest intimacy where we say, God, here it is. I can't do it on my own. Will you help me so that I can be the best version of myself can be? So I can get up every day with clean eyes and clear heart and love people the way that Jesus loved me. That's the gospel. Will you pray with me? God, thank you um, 
for your grace. It's unbelievable, remarkable, and healing. We've touched on some real tender stuff today, Lord. Stuff that we're all carrying. And we've all been hurt and all been wounded. Help us to forgive. We know we need to release the person that's hurt us because you've released us. But we also know that you need us to be released too. So just with your love, wash over us, cleanse us, and make us whole. We offer all of this to you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people did say, Amen. Sometimes it's hard for me to understand why we pull away from each other so easily even though we're all walking the same road yet we build dividing walls between our brothers and ourselves well i i don't care what label you may wear if you believe in jesus you belong with me in the bond we share. It's all I care to see. We will change the world together if you will join with me. Join and sing. Sing that you're my brother, you're my sister. So take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. is king it will echo through the earth it will shake the nations and the world will see see that you're my brother you're my sister so take me by the hand together we will work until he comes there's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side as long as there is love, we will stand. Take me by the hand, join with me. Bitterness is such a burden that we carry. Unfortunately, it's not the only burden that we carry. There's a reason, though, why uh, our community of faith chose to put a scripture on our church building outside that you may have seen. It's a quote from Jesus. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, for I will give you rest. 
It's a reminder to everyone who passes this street that our Lord is available to help us shoulder the burdens we carry, to offer us a different way, one of God's love. And each time we gather here at table, we call into our midst the very presence of a Christ whose yoke is easy and burden is light. So I invite you this day back to table. We remember that Jesus was gathered with those that He loved and He took the bread that was there and He blessed it and He broke it. And He gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is My body given for you. Eat it and remember Me. In a similar manner, He took the cup after supper and giving thanks for it, He passed it among them and said, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. And as often as you gather, eat of the bread and drink of the cup, and do so in my name. For these sacred gifts, let us give thanks to God in prayer. God, we are grateful for the bread and cup to draw us closer to you. As this is an act of connection, we have heard that bitterness is an act of separation, keeping us from the abundant life you want for each of us. Help us then to follow Christ, to choose joy, and to release bitterness. Amen. Friends, this table is hosted by Christ, and all who believe are invited to participate in this sacred meal. May, in the breaking of the bread and the outpouring of cup, may you find the presence of the one who eases our burdens. Thanks be to God. so glad that you have been in worship with us today on this second Sunday in Lent. Whether here in our sanctuary or at home in your own sanctuary, we hope that you have been blessed and enriched by this opportunity to be in worship together. We're so grateful to stay in touch with you throughout the week by email, by phone, by Facebook and YouTube. We're always so glad to stay connected in these days. 
We're so thankful that so many of you are reporting that you've received your first and even second vaccinations, and we continue to pray for our community as that opportunity becomes available. We hope everyone that can will receive those, and we are already considering the ways that that might allow us to move more and more into the church life we envision for the future. We also want to remind you, as our health authorities have reminded us, that even while we are vaccinated, we practice precautions. So as you leave the sanctuary, we hope that you will watch your distance from those around you, move all the way out into the parking lot, and take some room to greet each other out there. We hope that wherever you are today or throughout the week, you will be prayerful for your church community, and you will share with us the ways that we can pray with and for you. As we leave worship today, we draw our attention to our Lenten symbols. Last week, we started with the purple cloth for the royalty of Christ the King and also for the season of penitence and reflection. Today, we've added a basin and towel, reminding us of the servant nature of the Christ we follow, one of the many ways that we name and remember the one who calls us to serve in the world. We come as followers of a humble servant, and we try every day to love like Jesus. Go in peace to be those servants in a world that needs you. Amen.